I'm Hari Berzins, and this is The Community Show. November has a lot of wonderful things in store for us as we anticipate the holidays. We have two parades in Floyd this month. The first one will happen on November 12th. On behalf of all Floyd veterans, the VFW post number 7854 invite you to join them for the Floyd Veterans Day Parade. It will happen again November 12th at 3 o'clock. It will begin at Mayberry Funeral Home and proceed north on Route 8, right at the stoplight and end at Wood Funeral Home. If your organization would like to join the parade, contact John Phillips at 540-239-1478. The second parade will happen on November 26th, and that's Floyd Merchants Association, Floyd's annual Christmas parade at three o'clock and the rain or snow date is December 5th. If your organization would like to join the Christmas parade, contact Susan Leonard at 540-250-8486. Entry fee is only $10. For a comprehensive list of Floyd County events, check out the calendar at visitfloydva.com events. And now we'll visit Floyd Historical Society and the Curtis Turner exhibit. Welcome to the Floyd County Historical Society Museum, the Ridgemont Hospital. Come on in. Hello, I'm Gino Williams. I'm a member of the Floyd County Historical Society and a lifelong resident of uh, Floyd County. Uh, I want to welcome you to what is our exhibit here in the museum based on sports and recreation in Floyd County. You see here a finely crafted copper steel which was probably fabricated in a local blacksmith shop. It produces approximately three gallons if we were to run it. In 1983 local trooper Jimmy Howry was given a tip that this steel was operating in Floyd County. Uh, trooper Howry called the local ABC uh, people and in addition the local sheriff's office and they went to this steel or the steel site and discovered uh, what is in front of you. The barrel is an add-on but the original worm and copper steel are here. The steel belonged to a gentleman by the name of Emmett Guy White of Indian Valley whose grandfather had used the steel prior to Prohibition. Special Agents B.J. Weddle, Deputy Jerry Opp, and Trooper Howery, along with Agent Jack Powell and Sheriff George Branscombe, found the steel in October of 83. Recognizing its historical significance, they preserved the steel. This steel, uh, through the efforts of Marguerite Tice and Prentice Thompson uh, and the Floyd County Historical Society, received this through a court order and they have been the beneficiaries and owners ever since the trial of Mr. White. Uh, Trooper Howery, in attempting to locate Mr. White, also came upon another large steel site that was making a lot more than three gallons of liquor. Uh, the steel itself is probably about 150 to 200 years old. It is in immaculate shape and it, it's fairly interesting for everybody who wants to take a look at a small personal steel uh, of, of vintage quality. So they smashed this moonshine still. Yeah, the revenuers would have smashed the steel, brought it into town to show it off. So it's a smashed up moonshine steel. So who do you think is in that picture? The revenuers? No, I would say that's revenuers and local law enforcement. And this is in Floyd? Um, as you can see, the building to the right is Farmer Supply. So it's right in the middle of town. You may wonder what a moonshine steel is doing in the middle of a sports exhibit. Legal and illegal alcohol played a role in two of Floyd's more interesting recreational activities. We don't think of fighting as a recreational event, though boxing clearly has its roots in hand-to-hand -hand combat. In the 19th and 20th centuries, fighting fueled by alcohol was a pastime for many men in some Floyd County locales. One area near the Buffalo, known as the Stomping Ground, or as in our old Stomping Grounds, 
was a place where some of the area's men gathered to drink and fight. Skating rink in El Tenedor was also known for fisticuffs. Locally produced alcohol played a part in the rough and tumble lifestyle of the county. The other part alcohol played in sports was in the delivery of alcohol to places where it could be consumed. Prohibition pitted alcohol producers against the government. Delivery by automobile led to chases where the fastest outlaw or law enforcement won. This need for speed led to faster and faster cars. A few adventurous men, having raced by foot or horsepower, took the next step and moved from the liquor business to the track to race their cars. NASCAR series derives from these routes. This steel, which we will talk about in a second, represents the historic role that alcohol played in the development of recreational activities in the county. While we do not minimize the negative effects that alcohol has had upon many lives, we realize that below the surface of many of our stories run threads, good and bad, that help us tell the story of our county. El Tenedor was a skating rink, and there were dances and skating, and it was you know, one of the few recreational opportunities. It was actually a, uh, a well-attended place for many years, uh, up until the, I guess, 1980s. Mayberry's funeral home always kept on Saturday night kept an ambulance ready to go to El Tenedor to carry somebody to the hospital. Wow. And there was the fighting usually occurred between the Franklin County boys and the Floyd boys. Uh, they would take or turns. The Buffalo Mountain boys. Exactly. Or the Mountain boys. There were groups that would pass back and forth, but uh, Franklin and Floyd fought a lot. That was a lot of it, and they'd go back down to Franklin usually on Saturdays. I think it was. Floyd on Fridays and Franklin on Saturdays is how it worked out, and they'd usually fight in both places. The automobile and the production and delivery of moonshine during Prohibition combined to create what we know as stock car racing, essentially a product of the mountain areas of Virginia and North Carolina. The earlier races between the bootlegger and the law eventually led in the post-World War II era to on-track races. The drivers of these fast cars were still eager to prove who was the fastest and the best. In the mid-1950s, P.L. Sheeler and Dewar Drakes brought stock car racing to Floyd County. Floyd Speedway, advertised as a fast half mile, opened to a huge crowd in May of 1954. The huge opening day probably contributed to its de eventual demise. People traveled from all around to see the new track. Resulting traffic backups over several miles in length led many to refuse to again return to Floyd for a race. Other problems, many financial, ultimately led to the track's closure in the late 1950s. Eight of NASCAR's top 50 drivers of all time did race on Floyd Speedway's track. Buck Baker, Ned Jarrett, Junior Johnson, Lee Petty, Herb Thomas, Bob Welburn, Glenn Wood, and Floyd County's own Curtis Turner competed in races there. In addition, many local drivers would race on the dirt track. They included Turner Dehart, Joe Hill, Gilbert Linkus, Amos Nolan, James Nolan, Robert Peters, Johnny Rohr, J.A. Short, Melvin Smith, Pete Sowers, and Sonny Sweeney. Curtis Turner's training course had been the back roads of Floyd County and Frank, Floyd and Franklin counties when he was hauling shine. His exploits in a car were legendary, and as would be expected, many young locals tried to emulate his driving style. Curtis had one of the greatest years in NASCAR history in 1956. Over his career, he was credited with 360 NASCAR-sanctioned races, including 17 in the Grand National Today's Monster Energy Series. A couple of little stories about the track. The first was on opening day. The VFW in Floyd had agreed to run the concessions uh, in, here at the track. And they had decided, because they did not have electricity at the time, it hadn't, not, it hadn't been run to the track and never would be run down there, uh, that they would cook the hot dogs over at the VFW, which was about a mile away from the track. Because of this backup uh, and, uh, that uh, people getting into the track, they couldn't get the hot dogs there. And not a single hot dog that was cooked for the race that day ever made it to the track. And the second little story uh, has to do with uh, one of the drivers that raced here and that was uh, Jabe Thomas, who was from Christiansburg. And Jabe, uh, when I asked Ronnie, his son, about whether Jabe told stories about Floyd and the racetrack over here, Ronnie said he talked about it all the time because Jabe wrecked a car here in the early days of the track and had his front teeth knocked out. 
And he said he never forgot Floyd because of that fact, that the teeth were gone. The other thing is that there were all kinds of races, there were all kinds of other events and things, including circuses and things that were done at the track. But it ended primarily because the cost of running races through NASCAR sanction had gotten out of hand by the late 1950s because of the popularity. And there just wasn't enough money to pay both NASCAR and the drivers. And that's why racing shut down here in Floyd. 1956 was Curtis Turner's most successful year. Here's a picture of September 9th, 1956, Curtis leading lap 160 of a NASCAR convertible international race at Soldiers Field, Chicago Land Speedway, Chicago, Illinois. The car is a 1956 V8 Ford. Curtis went on to win the race, his 17th convertible race in 1956. He would win 22 that year in this 26 car. He won one of the big races in that car. Clearly his best year. This is a 1957 Life Magazine poster of Curtis Turner and his prime. Coming off what was probably his greatest season in 1956, he was, two, was a two-time Grand National most popular driver in 49 and 56. Won 17 Grand National races. In his career, Curtis was credited with 360 wins in all NASCAR divisions. Known originally as the Blonde Blizzard of Virginia, and later as Pops for his own track contact with other cars. Curtis has been recognized as one of the top 50 NASCAR drivers of all time. This is a cover of Sports Illustrated, February 1968. King of the Wild Road, Curtis Turner. Curtis Turner was the first NASCAR driver to ever appear on the cover of Sports Illustrated. This is a print of Curtis in Smokey Unit built 1965 Chevelle. Curtis became the first driver to exceed 180 miles an hour in this car while in qualifying for the 1965 Daytona 500. This is the print that hung in Smokey's garage, the best damn garage in town. This is the uh, 1965 Smokey Unix Chevelle that Curtis had placed on the pole at Daytona. Uh, he raced this car the following week at Atlanta and during uh, practice he rolled the car over down the straightaway. Uh, Smokey told him that he would never let him back in the car, in one of his cars again, and Curtis asked Smokey why he would do that, and Smokey told him he didn't want him to die in one of his cars. This car probably was doing uh, as fast as it had at Daytona when it left the track and rolled barrel rolled down the front straightaway. As mentioned earlier, Curtis ran in many different divisions. Here's a picture of Curtis in an Indianapolis Speedway car that was also built by Smokey Unit. It's probably just as well that Curtis and Smokey didn't get together when Curtis was younger because Curtis, uh, with Smokey's technology and Curtis's driving style, they would have been going really fast and probably wrecked a lot of cars. Smokey was so far advanced in, in his engineering of these vehicles and in the motors that some of the things that are used on these cars to, today actually came from his uh, ingenuity uh, back in the uh, mid-1960s. Hi, I'm Margaret Sue Turner Wright, Curtis Turner's oldest daughter. I have another sister, Priscilla Galvin. She's not here today. Um, I'm here per, uh, helping to promote the whole idea of um, Floyd history. It happens to also include my dad, Curtis Turner, who was a race car driver. And um, I worked real hard to try to get him into the NASCAR Hall of Fame, which he is there, which is great. And this is a painting, one of the first paintings that I did of him. And uh, it's an oil painting. He's in an open, uh, open racer here. Uh, but most of the time he drove uh, regular street uh, stock cars. And his most successful, I would say, run was in 1956. And uh, he was in a 1956 Ford and he won many races. I have uh, some memorabilia, and his race car is at the, um, at this time, we brought it back from the NASCAR Hall of Fame, and it is now in the Virginia Museum of Transportation in Roanoke, Virginia. This is a, a picture of me. I really haven't changed much, um, but I am wearing Nancy Sinatra boots. That is one difference. That's really it. Okay, so I'm on the top of one of my dad's race cars that he used when he was teaching um, in the safe high performance driving school that he started, which by the way was the first one in uh, the United States that we're aware of, and that was at the Charlotte Motor Speedway. 
So um, I took the course and I loved it and I learned how to do 180s um, on wet pavement and dry pavement and gravel. It was just tons of fun. Well, what it's like to have my dad as a father, it was always interesting. It was never dull. Uh, parties at my house were very interesting as well. We lived on 10 acres of land and when he let me have a party there one night, <laughs> everyone was driving through the field and doing 180s. <laughs> it was really funny. <clears throat> Fortunately, we, the neighbors liked us, so um, that, that worked out. Another time he took me and my friends when I was older um, in college, at Roanoke College, um, he called me up and said he had an old Greyhound bus and would we like to go uh, for a little ride? And he called it the Champagne Ride. And I said, sure, Daddy. So he came and picked us all up and it was gutted. There was not hardly anything in it. There was barely a few seats left still and he was having it redone. So we got to go uh, on a, this Champagne Ride with him all over town. It was so funny. And that was kind of a fun thing he did for me and my friends. Um, of course, my most favorite thing is that he taught me how to drive, and I felt that <clears throat> what he taught me was very defensive driving, as well as just how to handle the car in a curve. <laughs> because um, if you know how to, how to handle a car in a crisis, you feel a, empowered a little bit, and um, that's really helpful. These days, we have a higher center of gravity on these SUVs, and I had a person just try to cut me off the other day, and I'm going like this because it, you know, it's it's a different kind of car now. So that's really different. But um, yeah, he he was um, very inspiring to me because even though he did not have a college degree, he um, really just you know he was he was he pulled himself up by his own bootstraps um, when he was trying to do things with the Charlotte, build the Charlotte Motor Speedway um, a lot of people said it couldn't be done and he didn't stop and he didn't think like that and even in racing he never thought that he couldn't do it it was just not that kind of a think thought that you know he would entertain he just went with his spirit he just went with what he loved and so he, he became successful at it. And of course, that's great to know that if you do something you love, you're going to eventually arrive. And so he did that, and he became really good with racing. And of course, he had a lot of practice up here <clears throat> in Floyd and uh, on the back roads. And uh, he also uh, taught himself how to fly. And um, he, he, my, I remember him and my mom sitting in the living room many times every night, and she was, you know, trying to help him. Okay, next question. And they were, you know, trying to get ready so he could actually fly. He couldn't get anywhere fast enough, and so he was tired of tickets, I think. And so he got an airplane. <laughs> he was the first uh, race car driver to actually have an airplane, and he did land it. Yes, on many different places, like on roads and. And in, in, in the, the speedway, he would ride, uh, fly it into the speedway at times. And, and um, he even let me fly the plane a few times. <laughs> um, and um, he just told me, you know, keep that little thing, you know, kind of like that. <laughs> and, um, and he would get in the back seat and take a nap. <laughs> so, <clears throat> but I think that um, I love that he taught me how to drive. I love that he had such a positive, optimistic spirit about never doubting doing something just because of what anyone says. You just go for it because you're doing it because you love it. I was in my Mustang and this was 1967. I think I was just out of high school. 66, 67, okay. And <clears throat> I was coming down Peters Creek Road in Roanoke and um, there was Daddy. He came in this rental, this little white car. It looked like a Mustang. I'm not sure. It was an older model. It was a rental. And so uh, we pulled up next to each other, you know, gunned it a little bit and looked around. Everything looked pretty clear, so we just took off. It was so much fun. And I know I was at least two inches ahead, and all of a sudden it was like it, he backed off. And I couldn't understand. Well, oh, then there was a policeman in the back. Oh, my goodness, I was so scared. So, so uh, I just took off. And he slowed down, so the policeman stopped with him. 
I was so scared, my heart was just going 100 miles an hour. So I ran on up the, to our house, it was on uh, Laban Road, and we had a bed that's about four feet high up underneath it. And I actually was a teenager, but I went and hid under that bed. I was so scared, I didn't know if I was going to jail or if he, well, I'd never been stopped by the law, you know. And so um, I waited, I waited under that bed for a long time. And it was probably maybe, I don't know, you know, half an hour or something. It was terrible. It was just hot under there. So eventually, <clears throat> I would take little peeks out the window. And he didn't come, he didn't come. Oh, gosh, I hope he didn't go to jail, you know. So finally, I looked out the window, and he here he comes up the driveway. The policeman was coming with him. Oh, my God, I thought I was going to jail. I thought, oh, he's coming after me, too. I still went right back under the bed. <laughs> And I just stayed. Oh my goodness, I had to stay and stay and stay. And I think it must have been maybe another half an hour before every few minutes I would sneak up at the bedroom window and look out and see if he left. Well, finally I saw him go down the driveway. I noticed it didn't look like he had daddy was in the car. And <clears throat> so I left the bedroom. I went into the trophy room, which was his office. I went, oh, thank goodness you're here. I was so afraid he'd taken you to jail. And he's not gonna take me to jail? He said, no, honey. We're not going to jail. He, he used to be my bag boy at uh, grocery at um, up in Floyd. <laughs> Another thing that happened at the house in Charlotte, um, when Daddy uh, was testing a car for uh, Smokey Eunuch, number 13, gold and black um, Chevy. Oh my goodness. It was a beautiful car. And <clears throat> he actually uh, broke a speed limit. Um, uh, when he was testing um, at 100, he was the first one to go 180 miles an hour, which I think most people know that, but um, what they may not know is that when he was, um, when he was actually um, going around uh, in the track, um, they were racing, uh, he, something happened and he went up in the air and uh, the car turned over and over and over and over. And he said it was like you could hear a pin drop. It was so quiet up there. And, <clears throat> and he came down, and he was actually able to get out of the car. It didn't kill him. It didn't do anything to him. It was amazing. And they brought that film home. And so we watched it in Charlotte. And I was, I'm sitting there looking at my daddy flying through the air over and over and over. And I, I kind of thought like it might have been 10, 13 times or something. You know, it was just incredible. And finally he came back down. So <laughs> that kind of messed the car up a little bit. <laughs> and, uh, but one of the great things uh, is later on when Daddy got reinstated, he was kicked out at one time, as you know, it was a big thing with um, Bill France, but they ended up friends. I know, because uh, he was actually Paul Bear at my dad's funeral. And, <clears throat> but Daddy was able to get into a comeback race and he was um, in his number 41 car in 65. Um, it was great, he uh, won it, and he drove with a broken rib. So, I mean, it's like he has such positive energy about just don't give up, just do what you love. That's the same thing over and over again. Well, I, in uh, 2000, I started the online museum, uh, curtisturnermuseum.com, and the reason I started it was people really at that time did not know what he had done. They did not know his impact on racing, um, on the sport, how it's, it's, it, it was back in the beginning, the frontiering, there were a lot of great frontiering people back then. And he had a colorful personality as well, and he was a great showman. And as a matter of fact, Bill France brought him back um, from uh, into his comeback time, uh, and he, he paid him to, 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 you know, do a little, show there, you know, drive around, do some 180s and whatever at the Charlotte Motor Speedway. So he, he wasn't afraid to do anything, you know, like that. And he, uh, he won 360 races and uh, all of the different associations, um, USAC and as well as NASCAR and, and other ones and ones that were not, that were before these major organizations were started. And uh, so he had a big impact, and he, he was there at the beginning of NASCAR. He was there when they had met at the Streamline Hotel in Daytona. 
and um, and he he supported Bill. They were friends from the very beginning. In the Mexican Road Race, he and Bill France were in the Mexican Road Race in 1950, which is a great story in the back of my book if you happen to have it. <laughs> um, Curtis Turner Racing Stats. You can get it on Amazon. Th that's just uh, a neat little story that the news people covered. Uh, they, the helicopter was more interested in the way Daddy was driving than the person who was actually in first place. Well, for one thing, he was coming down the hill, and he had to slow down, but he didn't have any brakes. He was coming down a mountain, and he didn't have any brakes, and he really did use the wheel to slow him down on the side of the road, you know, on the edge. And so he just did, you know, whatever it took, used his resources. So, uh, so there, there's all these interesting stories, and um, he, he was also in NASCAR, um, you know, uh, supporting it, and came back to it. He was also in the meeting where they uh, voted, he voted, yes, get seatbelts in cars. He, he, he voted for that, you know. And um, he did so many things like that. So he had a big impact on the sport. It's become an international sport as we know now. But uh, I, I really wanted people back then to know these things. They, nobody knew a lot of this, and they didn't know who he was. A lot of people didn't. So I was willing to go to Mexico, and I talked to the president down there. And my husband and I had gotten together <clears throat> some people who uh, could give us a truck, you know, the, a trailer and everything, and uh, give us a car. We were going to get a car. We were trying to get that worked out. And we were uh, going to put ourselves into the Mexican road race, but I wasn't going to drive the whole thing because I couldn't probably do that. <laughs> but I was going to start it and then have, you know, a team of really great racers to take over and do the whole thing. That's a week long race and you've got to start up high and then you've got to reset the carburetor and everything, good to adjust to the, um, the altitude. And it's just really hard on you. And oh, it's grueling from what my dad even said. And he did great. And um, so, you know, he, he, that, that was another thing that he did. Uh, one time, daddy said, I bet there's timber on the moon. And he was a dreamer. And where do you get if you don't have a dream? You gotta have a goal. You gotta have something to inspire you, a vision within. Well, he was looking at the moon one night and he had been selling, you know, timber. He was a timberman by his trade that his own dad, Morton Turner, taught him. He knew every tree. He could guess from air how much acreage was actually covered with poplar or whatever. He could guess the acreage. It was amazing what he could do. And so he, he was one evening looking up at the moon and he said, I bet there's, I bet there, I wonder if there's, you know, timber up there. If we could get up there. That didn't work out, but during that time he also thought, well, I need a lot of money to do this. I think it could work. I think we could get there. Private enterprise. He was all about private enterprise. Well, he said, I bet I could advertise on the side of a dollar bill. I could sell advertising on the side of that dollar bill. Because he really wanted to, he really wanted to do that. He wanted to put advertising on the side of the dollar bill. And he was going to, he was going to sell it. He had, you know, a whole big business with it. And um, Senator Strom Thurmond was um, on it with him. And he met with, you know, different people in government to see if he could get it off the ground. And I think what happened is um, the government said, no, I think if you do it, no, mm, we want to do it. <laughs> so it didn't quite work out. And there's interest in a marker for uh, his birthplace, which is up here. And so we're real excited about that and trying to get that going now. We have an exhibit at the uh, Virginia Museum of Transportation in Roanoke, Virginia. And that's where the 56 Ford is right now, the convertible that's really cute has really cute wheels, I love them. And so that's down there. We're building an exhibit to have an event pretty soon and I hope that you'll stay tuned because um, I have several um, ways that you can get in touch with me about that. I have Curtis Turner Museum website com. I ha also have Curtis Turner Museum on Facebook and uh, Curtis Turner the Racing Legend and different things like that. So there's one way or another, you will know when we're having it, that's where it will be. As you can see, Curtis Turner has a colorful history and lots of connections to Floyd County. The Floyd County Historical Society is currently working on having a marker put in place to mark Curtis Turner's birthplace. If you'd like to support this effort, please make your check payable to the Floyd County Historical Society. 
and send it to P.O. Box 292, Floyd, Virginia, 24091. Indicate Curtis Turner Marker Fund. I'm Hari Bersens, and thanks for watching The Community Show. If you have events you'd like to see featured on The Community Show, you can give us a call at 540-745-2111. Have a great month.